Hello and welcome to today's 10 minute CME on polycystic ovarian syndrome. I am Dr. Rakesh Sahai, I am Professor of Endocrinology at Usmania Medical College in Hyderabad. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, as all of us know, is, a, is the commonest endocrine disorder in women. The prevalence of PCOS in premenopausal women ranges from 6% to 20%. And this was first described in 1935 by Steen and Leventhal. It is a heterogeneous disorder that is defined by a combination of signs and symptoms of androgen excess, which can manifest in the form of hirsutism or other forms of hyperandrogenemia. Or you can have ovarian dysfunction, which presents with oligoenovulation or a polycystic morphology of the ovaries on ultrasonography. PCOS, although known from several years, remains a very poorly understood medical disorder because of its heterogeneous nature. The main problem is because of the difficulty in diagnosis of PCOS, because of its clinical heterogeneity, the different criteria that are available for diagnosing PCOS, and there's a lot of variability in the diagnostic criteria that are used. And there's no specific laboratory test which can be called to be pathognomic of PCOS. Similarly, even the radiological findings, which we think are very specific for PCOS, are not always the uh, sign and Quran for PCOS. The ovarian morphology, which we always speak of, is not pathognomic of PCOS. And the insulin resistance, which is an important diagnostic criteria, is, is an important uh, pathophysiological abnormality, is not present in the diagnostic criteria. Hence, diagnosis of PCOS is a diagnosis of exclusion where we need to exclude several other conditions which can mimic a PCOS. And what are those conditions? Those conditions could be either hypothyroidism, hyperprolactinemia, non-classical adrenal CH, Cushing syndrome, or syndromes of glucocorticoid resistance. Or it could be even ovarian and adrenal tumors which present with hyperandrogenism. Or it could be simple idiopathic hirsutism where we do not find any other cause for hirsutism. So all these conditions can have features similar to PCOS and we need to exclude these conditions before we make a diagnosis of PCOS. So let us look at some of the various uh, aspects of PCOS. If you look at the core components of PCOS, we see that the they are hyperandrogenism, chronic oligoanovulation and the polycystic morphology on the ultrasonography. So let us discuss about each of these components in, in a little detail. Hyperandrogenism is basically excess of androgen levels in a female which can manifest in various forms. It can be either in the form of acne, it can be form, in the form of hirsutism which is the presence of thick dark terminal hair in androgen dependent areas of the body like the chest, the chin, upper limbs, abdomen or the thigh. Or it could even be a main part, pattern of baldness in a woman who has excess androgen levels. In extreme degrees, you find signs of virilization which can manifest in the form of mus increase in muscle mass, deepening of the voice or enlargement of the clitoris. If you look at the typical menstrual problems that happen in women with PCOS, the classical abnormality being oligomenorrhea in the form of cycles which are more than 35 days in length and very often women with PCOS have cycles which are less than nine uh, less than nine cycles per year and occasionally menstrual cycles may be normal but the menstrual flow may be very light some women with PCOS do not menstruate at all so we need to consider PCOS if the menstrual irregularity starts off around menarche and continues for more than one year while if it is starting many years after puberty or if there is sudden worsening, then we need to look at other conditions other than PCOS. Insulin resistance, which is the most important pathophysiological problem causing PCOS, can manifest in the form of abdominal obesity, presence of acanthosis nigricans or even in the form of skin tags. As you can see in these pictures, you can appreciate these uh, abnormalities. When you look at the radiological features on the ultrasonography of the abdomen, we find that uh, the classical description of uh, Rotterdam in 2013, 2003, when the earliest classification of Rotterdam was initiated, the description was 
the presence of 12 or more follicles measuring 2 to 9 millimeters in each of the ovaries or increase in ovarian volume to more than 10 cubic centimeters. Subsequently, however, there has been a lot of improvement in the ultrasonographic uh, uh, techniques with the uh, use of higher uh, transducers, higher uh, transducers and also use of transvaginal ultrasonography. And with this, the follicle number per ovary has been increased to more than 25. And once again, the follicles need to be in the size of 22 to 9 millimeters, less than 10 millimeters. And the ovarian volume has to be more than 10 ml in the absence of a dominant follicle. However, we need to keep in mind that these features may not be very characteristic and not reliable in adolescent girls and in perimenopausal women. If you look at this figure which tells us about the etiopathogenesis of PCOD, what we can understand from this is that there are several etiological factors which influence the development of PCOS. It could be either genetic factors, it could be epigenetic influences, modifying the genetics, obesity and a sedentary lifestyle and several other environmental factors. And all of them act either at three levels. They could either act at the ovary causing ovarian dysfunction, which in turn leads to excess androgen production in the ovaries, or it could dysregulate the hypothalamic pituitary axis, leading to a excessive activity of the GnRH pulse generator leading to a uh, higher frequency of GnRH secretion and that in turn leads to increased LH uh, secretion which in turn again leads to increased androgen levels or it could be affecting the insulin sensitivity and once insulin resistance develops it once again influences the LH secretion at the hypothalamus and also alters the SHVG levels. So whatever the reason, as we can see, there is increase in antigen production and this, this manifests in the form of hirsutism, acne or alopecia and it also leads to anovulation, subfertility and irregular menses. And women PCOS have long term risk of developing type 2 diabetes, they have a risk of endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial cancers, they have a risk of cardiovascular diseases and they may also have various psychological disturbances. If you look at the environmental influences which can have an effect on the development of PCOS, it is mostly an unhealthy habit consisting of a high fat, low fiber diet, sedentary lifestyle, smoking or alcohol consumption. All these can have an influence at different stages in the life cycle of a woman. When they have an effect in early adulthood or adolescent period, it can lead to the development of PCOS, hypertension and hyperandrogenism with its various manifestations. And these women are at higher risk of developing gestational diabetes and hypertension during pregnancy. And this effect is carried on to the fetus that can lead to intrauterine growth restriction, small for gestational age babies. And then the babies who are born have a thrifty phenotype and they are predisposed to develop obesity and uh, other metabolic abnormalities in early adulthood. So this is how the effect of un un unhealthy lifestyle can influence the development of PCOS. When you look at the diagnostic criteria for PCOS, we see that uh, there has been a lot of change from the early years of the NIH criteria being proposed in 1990, where the focus was mainly on the menstrual irregularities and the hyperandrogenism. The Ultrasonographic features were not given importance, they were not, did not find a place in the diagnostic criteria. Whereas in the Rotterdam criteria of 2003, the ultrasonographic features found a place and any, at least two out of the three abnormalities had to be present for the diagnosis of PCOS to be made. That is the presence of either chronic oligoanovulation, hyperandrogenism or polycystic ovarian morphology. So any two of these three have to be present to, for the diagnosis of PCOS to be made. While subsequently the Androgen Excess Society found that there is an important role for hyperandrogenism and it has to be present in every woman with PCOS. And so they propose that hyperandrogenism is an essential criteria and one of the other two could be present for the diagnosis of PCOS. So this is how the diagnostic criteria have evolved over the years and all of them always speak about exclusion of secondary causes such as thyroid dysfunction, hyperprolactinemia, a non-classic CH, adrenal ovarian tumors, tumors, 
Cushing syndrome or acromegaly. So the clinical bottom line is to look for features of PCOS in the form of irregular menstruation, infertility, obesity and hyperandrogenemia. Exclude other conditions which can cause similar symptoms and always keep an eye for ovarian or adrenal neoplasms where the androgen levels are extremely high. Make a diagnosis if more than two of the following are present that is oligoanovulation or elevated circulating levels of androgens or polycystic ovarian morphology. And always remember that the symptoms of PCOS start around puberty and continue to be present. Whereas if you have a wound presenting with features with these features several years after puberty or if there is a sudden worsening of these features, then you should always look for other diagnosis. We also understand from this uh, diagnostic criteria, particularly the Rotterdam criteria, have given us four different subtypes of PCOS. The classic subtype of phenotype A, which has all the features, all the three features being present, oligoanovulation, hyperandrogenism, and the PCO morphology and ultrasonography. While the phenotype B is essentially the initial one which fits into the NIH criteria, that is, without the PCO morphology and ovarian ultrasonography, but the presence of hyperandrogenism and oligoanovulation. The phenotype C is the ovulatory PCOS, where you find that they don't have menstrual irregularities, but have features of hyperandrogenism and have PCO morphology on the ultrasonography. Then we have a phenotype D, which is the non-hyperandrogenic phenotype, which is not picked up by the androgen excess society criteria. So this is a subset of women who do not have features of hyperandrogenism, but have menstrual irregularities and PCO morphology on the, on the ovarian ultrasonography. The phenotype A and B are the more severe phenotypes and these are the one, these are the women who have a long-term higher cardiovascular risk also. So as you can see from the previous discussion, what we've understood is that they could be different women with uh, different uh, features, all of them being satisfying the diagnosis for, for PCOS. So you could have those with the classic PCOS phenotype, there, there could be others who have a ovulatory PCOS, there are others who have the hyperandrogenic features being very prominent. As you can see in this cartoon, uh, there could be a lot of overlap and there are uh, different subsets of one who present with different features and that's why this makes PCOS a very heterogeneous disorder and all women with PCOS are not the same and they could have different manifestations, they could have different requirements and they could have different risks for, for the various long-term problems. So as we just discussed, the diagnosis of PCOS is once again, just to re-emphasize, the diagnosis of PCOS is done only when we have excluded thyroid dysfunction, CH, hyperplactemia, androgen secreting tumors or Cushing syndrome. So if you look at the algorithm for the diagnosis of PCOS, if you have features of sudden onset of symptoms, sudden worsening of symptoms, rapid progression or signs of virilization, then you should not think of PCOS, but go for adrenal or C adrenal imaging uh, by CT or MRI over in ultrasonography and try to look for adrenal or ovarian tumors. Whereas if you have the typical peripubertal onset, slow progression, absence of virilization, then we work this woman up for PCOS. We need to quantify the hirsutism, look for acne or alopecia, calculate the free testosterone levels, monitor ovulation, obtain ovarian imaging and look for secondary etiologies, try to exclude them. Particularly when you have a high baseline 17 OHP level, which is confirmed by doing a synactin stimulation, that confirms the presence of non-classical CAH. In the absence of these, if there is hirsutism with normal uh, free testosterone levels and regular ovulation and normal ovaries and, and, and uh, non-classical CH is excluded, then you should think of idiopathic hirsutism. Whereas a woman with PCOS will generally have hirsutism with elevated free testosterone levels, oligoanovulation and polycystic morpho uh, ovaries on, on uh, ultrasonography and we have excluded non-classical CH. So if you look at the long-term consequences in women with PCOS, 50 to 60% of them we see are obese. They have, uh, they have uh, 
abdominal obesity, which is described typically described as the apple shaped obesity, unlike the usual pear shaped obesity, which we see in, in females, in normal, female, normal women, where the distribution is of fat is more in the gluteo femoral compartment. When it is in the abdominal compartment, then this fat is metabolically very active, and these women are at higher risk of cardiometabolic disorders. So, women with PCOS have insulin resistance mainly because of the abdominal fat distribution and this insulin resistance can manifest in the form of hypertension because it leads to endothelial dysfunction it can manifest with uh, dyslipidemia it can manifest with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease obstructive sleep apnea impairment in the quality of life and when the and and it can lead to hyperinsulinemia which can have all these men uh, can lead to all these problems and when the pancreatic beta cells are unable to produce the excess amount of insulin that is required to overcome the insulin resistance, then diabetes develops. So what we see is that 30 to 45 percent of, of uh, women with PCOS have features of insulin resistance and this clustering of all these abnormalities and they have what is called as a metabolic syndrome. And apart from the classic metabolic abnormalities that we have just discussed, they could also be the presence of hyperuricemia, subclinical inflammation, hyperhomocysteinemia, procoagulant activity, and also increased mitogenesis. So these are all the metabolic abnormalities that can be seen in women with PCOS. So when we look at PCOS itself, what we are seeing is that when you're looking at the classical manifestations of PCOS, we are just looking at the tip of the iceberg in amongst all these women. They have a large number of cardiometabolic risk factors or abnormalities which are not identified if we are unless we are going to specifically look for them and these are the ones which are going to have a long-term problem i mean cause long-term problems to the woman with pcs so therefore every woman with pcs apart from the evaluation that we just spoken of should also have additional evaluation for a glucose metabolism for a glucose metabolism and also for, to screen for other cardiovascular risk factors so the test that we need to do is doing a oral glucose tolerance test. This may be done to identify abnormalities in glucose tolerance. And this can, this can sometimes be substituted by doing HbA1c, which can be uh, more easily done without the, having the need to have the woman go undergo a glucose tolerance test. Fasting insulin levels must be measured and fasting lipid profile also should be, should be estimated. We should screen for other kinds risk factors like the presence of obstructive sleep apnea, obesity, and look for a family history of early cardiovascular disease. BMI, waist circumference, and BP at every visit needs to be done without any further thought. PCOS women also present with uh, psychological disturbances, and that is another important area that needs to be looked at. In one of the studies, 72% of women had psychological disturbances. Coming to the management of PCOS, what we need to understand is that PCOS is a very heterogeneous disorder and all women with PCOS are not the same. They have different requirements. They present at different stages in their life cycle. And hence we can say that there is no universal treatment for PCOS. Treatment of PCOS is highly patient centered and symptom oriented. Only one of the uh, things that need to be, that is advised every woman with PCOS is a lifestyle modification. A healthy lifestyle is recommended in all women with PCOS. Patients with mild symptoms may not require any further intervention other than the lifestyle intervention. And so much so that we can say that there is the there is no specific drug which is approved for specifically for PCOS. So PCOS has got a heterogeneous presentation, different requirements, treatment is highly patient-centered and symptom-oriented, and there is no specific treatment for PCOS. The targets of pharmacological treatment should vary at different stages in the life cycle of the woman. When the woman presents with hyperandrogenism and hirsutism, the focus should be on, on tackling the androgen excess. Those women who present with menstrual irregularities, the, the focus should be on that. While in women who are presenting with data with insulin resistance, with the manifestation of insulin resistance, the targets would be different. We would look be trying to address this issue and the treatment therefore is very dynamic and adapting to the changing circumstances, the needs of the wound and expectations of the individual patient. So the 
goal of treatment is basically to provide symptom relief, safe fertility planning, a general well-being and prevention of the long-term metabolic complications. And therefore, what we see is that the treatment is requires a multidisciplinary team with a nutritionist, a psychological, somebody providing psychological support, fertility counseling, management of the metabolic disturbances and looking at uh, providing uh, support in the form of contraception, emergent endometrial protection and management of the cardiometabolic risk. So this slide shows us all the management options that we have for PCOS. As we said, lifestyle modification is something which is recommended for all women with PCOS, diet restriction, exercise, weight reduction being the mainstay of the uh, mainstay, uh, mainstay for uh, main goals that we're looking at. Then we're looking at medical therapy, which could be in the form of uh, hormonal pills, the estrogen progesterone combined pills or progesterone pills with low androgenic activity like norethindone, desogestrel or norgestimate or it could be just anti-androgenic progestins or it could be ciprostrone estate or drosperinone. Then we have anti-androgens, various anti-androgens, the insulin sensitizers like metformin or it could be cosmetic therapy for the hirsutism and the other important aspect is the psychological support. The lifestyle modifications that we would advise to women with PCOS would be a calorie restricted diet, increase in physical activity and exercise training to target a weight loss of 5 to 10 percent in overweight women and 15 to 20 percent in obese women. This can lead to significant improvements in body composition, insulin resistance, glycemic glycemic parameters, improvement in the lipid parameters. It can regularize the cycles and also correct the hyperandrogenism. There are at least six RCTs and which have been done in this field and a meta-analysis of all these RDCs, uh, RCTs has shown that lifestyle modification reduces the androgen levels, increases the SHBG levels and there is a definite improvement in the hirsutism scores. For a woman whose main problem is of that of hirsutism, the man management is focused towards that and here the main focus is on cosmetic treatment or it could be pharmacological treatment. Cosmetic treatment could be short-term cosmetic uh, therapies like uh, threading, waxing, bleaching or shaving while the long-term treatments would focus on laser therapy or intensive pulse light therapy such therapies which can reduce the hair growth. Then pharmacological treatment suppresses the androgen production or action and this could be in the form of combined oral contraceptives, the anti-androgens, insulin sensitizers, in some cases, it could be glucocorticoids or the GNH, GNRH analogs. And even a combination therapy with combination of various drugs may usually be needed to, along with the mechanical measures. If you look at the mechanism of action of the hormonal contraceptive pills for hirsutism, they are the mainstay of therapy for hirsutism. They can be used as first line or in combination with other agents and they improve the hirsutism in 60 to 100 percent of women. How do they act? They act at the at the hypothalamic or pituitary, hypothalamic pituitary axis to reduce the LH secretion and the LH secre reduction in LH leads to lowering of androgen production. Then they also help in increasing the SHVG production in the liver and this in turn leads to increased binding of the free testosterone and decreased availability of free testosterone. And the progestin component of the hormonal contraceptives also interferes with the androgen action at the androgen receptor and thereby reduces the action or I mean, they re thereby reduces the hirsutism. It also leads to inhibition of the 5-alpha reductase activity and thereby has this benefit of reducing the androgen action. However, there are some safety concerns with the combined oral contraceptives. They can lead to nausea, vomiting, breast tenderness. These are all transient side effects. They can be a weight gain of 1 to 2 kgs. The major problems that we are worried about are the increase in risk of venous thromboembolism which increases almost three to five fold in women who are predisposed for that, particularly those who have got hypertension, those who have got pre-existing diabetes or those who have a history of thromboembolic disease. And then there is an increase in cancer risk also, a small risk of cervical breast cancers. Risk increases with the duration of use, but this risk does not increase in 
does not uh, increase after discontinuation. So the good point is that after discontinuing that the risk comes down. They reduce the ovarian and endometrial cancer risk. So the contraindications to hormonal contraception is in smokers, particularly women older than 35, those who are pregnant and breastfeeding, those who have a history of migraine or hypertension, diabetes, thromboembolic diseases, those who have history of clotting disorders, current malignancies, or those who have a high risk of breast cancer. Let us quickly look at the anti-androgen drugs. The anti-androgen drugs can block the androgen receptor, such as uh, spinolactone, flutamide, and ciproterone acetate have this action, while finasteride blocks the conversion of testosterone to diastosterone by the 5-alpha reductase enzyme. So if we look at ciproterone acetate, it acts by inhibiting the LH NFS secretion, thereby reducing the ovarian androgen production. It blocks the androgen effect at the receptor level and it also has an effect of inhibiting the 5-alpha reductase, decreasing the DHT production. This can be given alone from the day 1 to 10 of the cycle or in combination with ethanide estradiol in the hormonal contraceptive preparation. The major side effects with ciproterone are menstrual irregularities, vomiting, headache, liver dysfunction and clotting disorders. Spinolactone is a very commonly used drug used for management of hirsutism. As we can see, it's, it acts as an anti-androgen at higher doses, while at lower doses it has the anti-mineralocorticoid effect. And it, uh, the major anti-androgenic effect are mainly by blocking the androgen receptor and also a partial 5-alpha reductase inhibition activity. It also suppresses the GnRH and LH because of the progestational activity that it has. It has an effect on hirsutism and also on acne, reducing the acne uh, counts and uh, it also reduces the hirsutism to a significant extent. The major problems being breast tenderness, menstrual irregularities and hyperkalemia can be a major can be a problem in some situations. Drosperinone and finasteride are the other anti-androgenic com compounds available. Drosperinone is derived from 17 alpha spinolactone. It has anti-androgenic and anti-mineralocorticoid actions. It is available in combination in OCPs with uh, 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 and the safety concerns are similar to that of spinolactone. Finasteride may be considered a response to OCP and spinolactone is inadequate. Flutamide is another non-steroidal anti-androgen. It selectively blocks the nuclear androgen receptor and it has a use in patients with BPH and prostate cancer. It can be used in hirsutism and acne. It's more effective than spinolactone. However, its use is limited because of its hepatic toxicity. So whatever anti-androgen that we're using, all of them are teratogenic. They can cause feminization of the genetidia in a male fetus. And hence, we have to be careful when a woman is planning for pregnancy. And it, they should be used only in women who are not planning for pregnancy and along with this safe contraception. Combination of anti-androgens like spinolactone and finasteride can also be uh, used in some situations where there is inadequate response to either of them alone. And this can be more effective than, than each of them used alone. However, data on combination therapy is limited. Coming to the insulin sensitizers, such as metformin, they are very often used in women with PCOS. They reduce the hyper, apart from having a favorable effect on the hyperinsulinemia, they also have a favorable effect on the hyperandrogenemia. A meta-analysis of 16 trials has, however, shown that there's not much of an effect on the FG score. They have a better efficacy in adolescents. They also improve the ovarian function, improve the ovulation rates and clinical pregnancy rates are improved when given with clomiphene citrate. They also reduce the risk for ovarian hyperstimulation. They decrease the risk of pregnancy loss in early pregnancy and also the development of GDM and preterm delivery. This was seen in the PregMet2 trial. The data with other insulin sensitizers like, like the glitazones is very limited and we are concerned about the use in reproductive age women and therefore we don't use them very often in patients with PCOS. When do we use metformin in PCOS? We would use it in patients who had features of insulin resistance, who have impaired glucose tolerance or type 2 diabetes where we would use it along with the lifestyle measures. We can use it in women who have a risk for development of gestational diabetes they can be used in women with menstrual irregularities if they are not tolerating the OCPs. 
they may be more beneficial for adolescents. Studies in adolescents with metformin have shown improvement in menstrual irregularity. They have reduced the antigen levels and also had a favorable effect on the lipid abnormalities seen in these women. However, the caution is that metformin should never be used as a drug to promote weight reduction. It's not a first line agent also for the cutaneous manifestations or the menstrual irregularities in PCOS. It's more for the metabolic abnormalities and the other benefits seen are probably seen to some extent in, in a few women. If you look at the decision making in hirsutism about which therapy is to be seen uh, to be used, what we need to understand is that for, uh, first issue that has to be looked at is whether the woman is seeking fertility or not. If she is seeking fertility, then we need to delay the treatment for hirsutism until the delivery. In those not seeking fertility, we are looking at lifestyle modification, cosmetic procedures, and those who do not have a contraindication to OCPs, that would be the first choice of therapy. In those who have a contraindication to OCP, then we would use anti-androgens with, along with some form of contraception. When we look at women with PCOS who are desiring fertility, the, it is important to there use various measures to improve the fertility. An important point is to address the uh, male factor also. The male factor would be present in at least one third of these women with uh, uh, who are coming for evaluation of infertility and they should be assessed for that. When only a female factor is suspected and only mild to moderate menstrual dysfunction is present, ovulation needs to be evaluated and carefully uh, uh, she should be uh, started on fertility promoting drugs. When ovulation is unpredictable or absent, ovulation induction is advised. Clomiphene citrate or letrozole should be considered as the first line drugs for ovulation induction. So as we have seen mm -hmm. that the management of PCOS is highly patient centered and symptom oriented and also depends at the stage of the life in which the woman is. When you are seeing a young woman who is presenting with menstrual irregularities or hirsutism, there the focus is on, the, on managing these problems while at an older age we are looking at uh, managing the cardiometabolic risk that is present, the cancer risk that is present and also managing the pregnancy complications. So management of PCOS is a, requires a multidisciplinary approach requiring the involvement of the right from a pediatrician, a dermatologist, gynecologist, endocrinologist being the center of the whole uh, orchestra and we may also have a cardiologist involved and a geriatrician also involved. So this is how the management of PCOS is highly patient centered. I would like to conclude by giving you the following take home points. PCOS is defined as a combination by a combination of signs and symptoms of androgen excess and ovarian dysfunction in the absence of other specific diagnosis. There is a lot of heterogeneity right from the etiology to clinical presentation and long term prognosis which is intrinsic to PCOS. Treatment should be symptom oriented, long term and dynamic and adapting to the changes, changing circumstances, the personal needs and expectations of the individual patient. The therapeutic approaches that are used should target the hyperandrogenism, the consequences of ovarian dysfunction and the associated metabolic disturbances. Thank you all.